Hello, everybody. Can you all see us? So very sorry for the delay. Yeah, Raghu, can you check that everything is OK there? <laughs> OK. So this has just gone a little different from what our regular is. And so very sorry for that. So uh, we are starting off, and we will see how it goes. And uh, yeah, let's just start with our video. In the meanwhile, Dr. Radhika is having some technical issues with her presentation. She's trying to sort it out in the background. Don't worry. If nothing else, we shall just have a discussion on the topic. We have enough experts right here. So let, let's just start with the whole program as we would normally, right? You make me win. You cut me loose and set me free. You make me win in every way. You show me how to spread my wings. It's on the way. So good so, morning good. again, everyone. And uh, why am I having a feedback? Okay. Anyone else having a feedback? No? Okay. So coming to today. Now, I'm just seeing this on uh, the first and foremost, I got to start from the beginning, which was meant to happen. So last week we had uh, the Sarah in India. This is our season of celebration. So I should wish everybody a happy Dasera. It also marks the beginning of preparations for another uh, celebration, for another festival, and that is Diwali. We are a very festival-rich country. We go from festival to festival, and it, it's fun. It's, uh, it's really enjoyable. We love it. And some of the festivals have specific uh, you know, representations involved, among those being, of course, Dasera, which is generally the uh, what I would say, the success, the winning of evil over, I mean, of, sorry, of good over evil, although it is in two different forms. And one of those actually involves a goddess deity, so which uh, which is all good for women power. We are very happy with that. And uh, then, of course, today is the Prophet's birthday, Prophet Muhammad's birthday, and what we call Miladun Nabi. So I wish everybody for that too, and I wish everybody multiples of very, very happy festivals very, very in the world you are. Now coming to uh, this uh, picture you are seeing on the screen is of the first ever dental uh, short stories competition. And uh, it's going to be a book. Everyone who submits one is going to have this story included in the book. And I hope you will take the chance. A lot of people have been asking me, but what sort of stories? And what do you mean by stories? So I'm going to take a minute to tell you what sort of stories. And I think it's the best thing if I just share from my own experiences. So coming to, you know, every one of us are made of stories. So what are those stories? Every experience we have and every experience we share becomes later becomes our story. It's what we are. And among the many stories that I have and the many things that matter to me a lot is, of course, me as a teacher or what I became as a teacher. And out of those, I will just share three stories with you. Uh, they'll be short. Don't worry. It's just to give you an idea of what sort of stories. So the first one was when I was just in the first year of my college in BDS. Our principal was among the senior most and definitely among the kindest people uh, in the dentistry at that moment, widely respected everywhere. Now, one of the things I always noticed about him is he would wish his students, his colleagues, he would treat everybody equal. The day you became a student, you were already a colleague. He respected us, invited us to his house for tea, uh, you know, welcomed every newcomer, whether it was a staff or a student in the same way. And from that, what I took was, Basically, respect your students from day one. They are your colleagues already. The second one was, uh, I, I, I was, as you might imagine, a rather mischievous student. So, and I was very lucky that most of my teachers were uh, so 
uh, so secure that no one really got upset with me. So one of those days and one of those times when I was being particularly mischievous, I went to one of these, one of my teachers who used to always tell me, no, this is not good enough, Mandana, do it again. And I actually took his own work, which he had shown me before to him, and he found faults with it. And I told him, sir, you just disapproved your own work. Of course, uh, there, there was this hush. Everyone thought now I had it. But all he did was, he said, so uh, just because that's my work, that doesn't, that's not the standard for your work. I can say you can be better. You should be better. My students should be better than me. There is no standard to say that you just have to be the same as me. So that was another thing I always found. Never fear your students becoming better than you. In fact, hope and try for your students to be better than you. That should be the aim. That was the aim at least I lived by. And the third and the last one was even uh, was a really interesting one. We had this, we were, we were just 40 of us in one batch. And uh, on one of those days when you're only 40 in a class, you know, nobody can really hide. So one of our batch mates fell asleep. And there was that typical nudging and slowly, you know, humming and you know, trying to get the fellow next to him to wake him up before the teacher saw. And of course, that was not possible. We were not subtle enough. Uh, we caught the teacher's attention and he looked around to see what we are trying, what we are going about. And then uh, he saw that he saw him sleeping. And all he said, hush, stop making a noise. You'll wake him up. Hello. <laughs> we were shocked. So we were shocked and we said, why? And afterwards, when we asked him, he said, you know, no student gets up first thing in the morning and says, let me go to class and sleep. He got up. He came here. He didn't want to sleep. He fell asleep because he couldn't help it. Not a big deal. Nothing lost. He'll get up. At least he has a, he slept now. He'll catch the rest of his classes better. Now, that was another thing I learned. And it was for me, which is, I guess, in a way, the reason if a student walked into my class, even with just two minutes left, I would let them walk in. I never turned away a student. And I always believe that students uh, are meaning to learn. If anything goes wrong here and there, it's not personal. It's not about us. It'd be a little too proud and uh, to think that anything another person does is really because of me. So essentially, they are just going on with their life on an everyday basis. And uh, when some things sometimes go wrong, one just needs to keep believing that students are meaning to learn. After all, why would they come here after, if not? Now, I know it's a long time since I was a teacher, but these were the things I lived by and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, teaching. Now, these are the kind of stories that we are looking for, stories that can give a message and stories of something you learned something that stayed with you, that became a part of your experience, maybe with a, with another student, maybe with a colleague, maybe with a teacher, maybe with a patient. You know, every time we interact, we become a part of each other's stories. So let's have that first collection of dental stories. Uh, submit your stories. There's still time till the 15th of November. And I hope you will join us. And I, we will have an ebook with all those stories in it. Now, going to the next thing, and uh, uh, let me first ask Dr. Radhika whether we got this worked out. Uh, Dr. Radhika, are we uh, set? Yes, Mandana, I will try to, you know, uh, do an extempore kind of thing. Uh, my colleague actually is trying to send you the PPT on Google Drive. Have you received it? Okay on google drive on which one of my accounts can you tell me which one mandana at oral pathology dot in okay i i shall look that yes. okay what i am going to suggest is uh, Hello, uh let's Sanjay let's finish with the start. rest of the introductions as we would do normally and then i will it take a moment music. you all uh, you all chat a little until I get that fixed. Yeah, we can finish the introduction still then. Yeah, okay, that's what. So we'll do the we'll do the introductions. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Now why is this not happening? Okay, this is really uh, Okay. 
Right. So today we are having another update on oral squamous cell carcinoma. And this one is going to be, as I guess everybody noticed by Dr. Radhika, who is going to be presenting the last missing, uh, missing piece of the... Okay. The last missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle as far as OSCC goes. Uh, it will be very, very interesting. And uh, on the panel, as again you have seen, we have Dr. Raghu. He is the expert today. He's been with us many, many times, of course. He is a professor of oral pathology, Manipal College of Dental Sciences, and director of international collaborations, Mahe, Manipal. He is also a professor at the Oman Dental College, Muscat, Sultanate of Oman. He received his PhD degree for his work on molecular pathogenesis of oral cancer by epigenetic mechanisms. His interest in oral cancer continues and has earned him the prestigious Marie Curie Fellowship and has been recommended for Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance Intermediate Career Fellowship. He credits a chapter in Schaefer's textbook of oral pathology and 70 research publications. He is also the director of international collaborations. He's involved in fostering academic and research cooperation globally. And he has, as you may notice from those number of pictures next to him, is that he has been on the channel many times. And actually, he has been there more times, but I couldn't fit the pictures. So <laughs> he is uh, definitely a fundamental and very important part of this movement and he is always there to help and thank you so much Raghu for being with us today too. Yes. And with us for the moderator we have Dr. Sandhya Tamgadge. She is the oral pathologist researcher and professor working in D.Y. Patil University School of Dentistry. She's highly talented and creative, and she's the only oral pathologist who has learned 3D animation work and created few 3D animation videos on histology and histopathological aspects of various diseases. She also has a YouTube channel, which you should uh, visit and also send your students to because she teaches carving there. She has received many awards and is known for her research work. She has a keen interest in patient education for which she learned a basic sign language course and created educational material for the hearing and speech disabled. She was also the oral pathologist in focus in a previous live stream. And she also supports us very, very closely. Thank you, Sandhya, for being here. And now I request you to please introduce Dr. Radhika while I try and check and see if I can get the, well, get the presentation. Thank you, Mandana, for the kind introduction. So Dr. Radhika MB is a professor and head of the department, Krishna Devaraya College of Dental Sciences, Bangalore. She is an academician, researcher, and consulting oral pathologist. She is a PG and PhD guide for Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore, recipient of fellowship by the Fellowship of Association of Indian Academy of Oral Maxillofacial Pathologists, she has completed over 40 research projects, over 100 publications, and 36 keynote lectures. She is a chairperson for Enroad for the data collection on oral diseases launched by IOMP 2019. She, is, she was a past honorary editor of, of uh, JOMFP journal. She was the expert for diagnostic approach to pediatric non-odontogenic maxillofacial tumors on the same channel. Thank you, Mandana, for considering me as a moderator for this session. It's an honor to be a moderator on this session with uh, eminent speakers. Thank you so much. Yes, you are most welcome. And now I'm going to stop this share. OK, so now I have to, OK, I, I can see a presentation here. I, I have uh, shared Radhika's presentation. Okay, wonderful. Excellent. And, okay, uh, okay. What, what Radhika has to do is just tell me next when she wants me to move the slide. Yes. Ravu, thank you. Thank you so much. That's okay. okay. I am your okay. brother, man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, we are good to go. Oh, we are good to go. I'm going to just add the stream. Okay. And... Uh, 
I will remove myself from the stream and I will remove Dr. Sandhya so that uh, Dr. Radhika and Dr. Raghu can interact and you know, uh, so you can hear and talk to each other, fine? Okay. Yeah, over to you, Radhika. Uh, yeah, can I start? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, on the onset, I really want to apologize for all the technical issues. I thank Mandana first for uh, bearing with me. And uh, next, I uh, really want to cons you know, uh, convey my sincere thanks uh, and so many other things to Dr. Raghu, who is actually an expert but he's going to help me to present uh, my presentation today. So uh, to correct what Dr. Mandana told, are we going to fit the last piece of the puzzle, you know, which makes us understand about squamous cell carcinoma? Now, I would like to tell, not the last piece, actually. I want to tell that today we might try and put one more new piece to complete the jigsaw puzzle to understand squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this is one of the oldest disease that we have seen, which has actually ravaged through the past and walking us rampantly through the present days and not allowing us to improve, you know, either the morbidity rates or mortality rates as far as, you know, uh, so much of research happens, so much of technology and uh, so much of uh, drugs being tried. But have we reached a better place? So... This is what I want to ask all of you. And then are we ready to give a new look? Next, Raghu. So this presentation actually comes from Bangalore, from Krishnadev Raya College of Dental Sciences. OK. I want the next slide. So what I want to tell is a lot of epidemiological studies are happening now. There are a lot of clinical pathological correlations. And the latest that we get to see is a huge amount of molecular studies and genetic studies which are happening. So all these studies, why are we doing them? So we need to focus into two spheres much more you know, clearly. One is if we are looking at early disease, we are actually looking at all these studies so that we prevent the you know, advancement of the disease, get a good diagnosis, which has a good hint on prognosis also, so the right and ample treatment can be instituted. The next is if we are looking at late disease, then certainly we should not give up, but still look for some parameters on prognosis that might be helpful for us to prolong the survival and the quality of life. So what I want to tell you guys is, in 2000, Hallahan actually gave us the hallmarks of cancer in which there were three, six parameters which were very you know, important, which included like you know, loss of apoptosis, proliferation, stemness, and angiogenesis. So one decade down from 2000, in 2011, what we are going to see is there are four new parameters which have creeped in because of new thinking, better understanding about squamous cell carcinoma. That is about, you know, immune evasion, then inflammation, which actually promotes tumorogenesis or carcinogenesis, the genetic instability, and also are there, you know, reprogramming of metabolism, which is done by actually the cancer cells. So all this, is this beyond histopathology or is it without histopathology? I'm a true oral pathologist, so I always feel everything is there in histopathology. But this time what we need to do is actually go one step ahead and see whether we get clarity. So we actually do not leave histopathology ever. There are still many answers that come to us in histopathology, but this time we go beyond histopathology and look at the role of cancer cells on a molecular basis, the interaction of these tumor cells and major factors that are involved in OSCC. Next slide, please. So here you can see from that day till today, where have we actually reached? So there are some things, some of the oldest things that we have to, you know, take cognizance of again is 
most of the cancers in our country are still associated with uh, uh, dr radhika one second uh, yeah. the uh, slide share is not happening in the sense it is uh, stuck on the first slide itself okay and not and it's issue. not on the okay, uh, okay. dr ragu can you go to the slide uh, the presentation view sorry just two seconds anyway also everyone was on a different youtube stream because apparently the stream also changed okay okay so i have sent a sent a message there for them to come decide okay 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 so if the presentation uh, you guys can see you can start from slide number 3 itself mandana i can start from right there can you see the slide uh, uh yeah okay yes 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 right uh, am i you can I, just go I to slide 3 have i gone to slide 3 can you see the slide i, I don't know radhika can tell us radhika is this the right slide yeah that's the right slide Okay. Wait. Are you able to see the slides changing, Radhika? Ah, uh, 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 I can. I, I should be able to see it. Is it? Yes. Could oh, okay. Okay. You should. Can I just request next each time, Raghu? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Now yeah. I have yeah. the third slide. Okay. Uh, do I start from here, Mandana? Please tell me. Then I will start. Yeah. Yeah. Please start. Please start. okay uh, so i was just telling that there are a lot of epidemiological studies happening these days and we would ask actually why do we need epidemiological studies at this point of time but we do need them we do need good amount of clinico pathological correlations uh, studies which in relate to you know clinical parameters and histological parameters and last but not the least the biggest lump of knowledge comes from the molecular studies or the genetic studies now all these studies what are they going to actually tell us how do they add light to the whole story and how can we improve our understanding and treatment of squamous cell carcinoma now basically we need to focus on two things one is all these studies can happen and you know help us in early disease to help us prevent give a proper diagnosis along with a good hint of prognosis and treatment planning and if we are looking at late disease then it certainly should help us to prolong survival along with quality of life we are actually doing a good job in squamous cell carcinoma if we are prolonging life only if we are able to add good quality of life next so we started in 2000 with hallmarks of cancer by hana so as you can see there are six main parameters for you know why cancer basically occurs but it is interesting in just a decade we have actually graduated with many more factors some of which are actually immune system evasion then tumor associated inflammation genetic instability and of course metabolic re reprogramming so all these parameters are the new parameters that have come into the hallmarks of cancer in 2011 so it self tells us that we have stepped into a new era and we need to step on to newer things and newer steps of understanding to get clarity about the disease only then can we treat it better next please so all of this does it happen without histopathology not really i think still a lot of answers comes via histopathology but this time what we need to do is actually go a little beyond histopathology so what we do is look at molecular studies and role of cancer cells at a molecular level what interactions do these tumor cells undergo and what are the great parameters different norms different new things to understand about squamous cell carcinoma next 
so here we will see that still we need to focus we cannot shut our eyes to the reality that still 47% of our cancers are associated with carcinogens which are either tobacco or areca nut related so almost 69 toxins which you know are just the number goes on increasing because of the different type of additives along with tobaccos come into you know tobacco products so these lead to genetic and epigenetic changes you cannot close your eyes to potentially malignant disorders because the conversion rate of potentially malignant disorders to oscc is increasing unfortunately not only increase the age group also is stepping down so we are seeing younger individuals with pmds and we are seeing younger individuals with oscc also and the next concept that we need to understand and pay attention on is field cancerization because this can make us susceptible to new primary or secondary tumors recurrences at a higher rate and some new interesting concepts that have emerged now is it, what is the role of microbes and microbiomes in oral cancers what does cancer immunology say so now all of us know that cancer immunology is as important as the, you know the fourth pillar so this becomes one of the most significant pillar in cancer treatment also and the last but not the least is something which is called as tumor micro environment next so first let us talk you know let us start with talk of cells so for a long time we have known tumor cells or cancer as a lump of dysplastic cells which talk irrelevant things to the host because of which they are you know unrestrained proliferate and form malignancies right let's go ahead so here you will see what happens is because of either genetic problems or epigenetic problems that are reintroduced at a later stage in life invariably it starts with the story of genes invariably you will see that there are 426 genes that are actually involved in cancer among this 322 are up regulated and one or four of them are down regulated all this happens up regulations and down regulations because of damages or changes or improper you know interpretations that are associated with chromosomes or at allele level or at the oncogenes or disturbance at the tumor suppressor genes or at the stage or level of nucleotides hello hello radhika uh dr radhika we have lost you hello radhika we are back yes sorry sorry so uh what, what happens is all this happens because of some kind of you know abnormalities how do these abnormalities creep in these are either because of you know improper deletions insertions of genetic material tandem duplications you know translocations inversions so any of these processes or multiple of these processes can get involved but let us see what happens because of these processes the effect or the influence of these processes is it finally ends up in improper transcriptional efficiency so what product was needed to be delivered it is either improper not delivered neither functional or maybe partially functional or functional in a very different way most of the times which might be damaged the quality and quantity of the resulting protein is also significant because it might be insignificant if improper proteins which are abnormal and in large loads and are you know credited so all of this leads to carcinogenesis next so is all of this just culminating in the formation of cancer not really most of this actually the host tries to set right 
with something which is called as DNA repair enzymes. Unfortunately, in most of the cancers, the repair enzymes are also hit. So single nucleotide polymorphism is something which we see commonly in oral squamous cell carcinoma. So in oral squamous cell carcinoma, we are, you know, as I told, most of the cancers are associated with tobacco use. So most of them are actually neutralized by our phase one and phase two enzymes. But because of defect in this enzyme systems or improper proper working of this enzyme systems, especially the P450 family or the, which is also called as the CYP family, and the commonest of the genes which are hit are the GSTT and GSTH. So these are the common genes that are hit. And that's the reason that our whole repair system collapses. So the guy who needed to check and correct the whole story collapses and comes under the hold of the cancer cells. Next. So here we can see why there has been a huge effort to set right the damage repair system. So DNA damage repair system, like I told, can be hit by either carcinogens as, you know, endogenous, uh, you know, uh, secretions, or it can be exogenous also, which can be induced by radiations. It can be induced by chemicals that come out of tobacco or arachanate or other products. So here you will see that, you know, either single nucleotide breaks or double standard breaks will, you know, happen. And these tables I have put just for you to see how much work is happening with, you know, base excision repairs, nucleotide excision repairs. So many drugs have been introduced to put the system in place because this is a system which might actually help us even at a slightly late stage to get the metabolism or homeostasis close to normalcy. Next. But what happens is, invariably you see the DNA system actually collapses and then you get the emergence of cancer. Now here is a complex biological process which actually is seen on this slide. So these are actually all the hallmarks of cancers which you want to understand. And most of it starts, the story starts with genetic and epigenetic events. Next. So after once the genetic and epigenetic changes happen, what happens? How do these cells progress? Now the cells progress very smartly. The cancer cells are some of the most intelligent. They use actually pathways which have been used by the human cells for normal metabolism or have been used in embryogenesis. So there are a number of canonical and non-canonical pathways that are used by squamous cell carcinoma. But we have successfully targeted some of the pathways that are frequently used by the cancer cells like the P10 pathway, Janus pathway also called as STAT3 pathway, the M kinase pathway and NF kappa B pathway. Most of them associated with, you know, uh, inflammation which supports can cancer. So invariably we still are unable to figure out which are the classic pathways the squamous cell carcinoma will take up. But these are some of the commonly used pathways. So depending on these also, a lot of drugs have been devised and they are also being tried. So at this stage at least, let us try and block the event so that it doesn't get into a progression mode. Next. Now, like I told, most of the fault is at the genetic or is because of epigenetic changes. Now, see the number of drugs that are being tried or that are being, you know, being used on a research basis. So, this screen shows you, you know, how epidermal growth factor receptor related drugs are put, vascular endothelial growth factor associated drugs. CMAT drugs and which block the TP, you know, TP53 activity. So there are numerous drugs which are being tried and already also being used. The dotted ones are the drugs which are actually also being used. Let us go to the next slide. So does the story end here? No. So we also go to the foot soldiers. You actually 
end up with the guys who help you in transcriptional activity you know to carry out the actual work so we end up with micro rnas so here we see a lot of you know single non coding rnas and long non coding rnas a lot of it like 31 34 375 and long non coding rnas so many of them actually take part in carcinogenesis especially oral squamous cell carcinoma but in all of this there is just one micro rna which has you know helped us with some amount of success that is mi rna 34 on which work is being done next let us not forget the story or the paint the cancer stem cells is painting us with in oral squamous cell carcinoma so this is one of the cause which is making us you know uh, not really fathom how to control the growth relapse resistance to treatment the cancer stem cells gets its credit because of these main factors now these cancer stem cells are not simple cells they are not actually common cells in the rest of the body cancer stem cells associated with squamous cell carcinoma as i am showing you on the right side of the screen uh, these are the numerous markers so you yourself will come to know that it's not one specific cell there are actually a spectrum of cell most of them stained by these ihc markers now these cells as it is have loads of stemness in them and they cannot be stopped but they are also blessed with a process called anastasis meaning even if they try to kill they come back from the brink of death with good amount of repair and refuse to respond to treatment or agents so this is the problem that raises its ugly head over everything in squamous cell carcinoma next so after all this you have seen genetic epigenetic changes you have seen how many you know genes are involved how many medications have been made for that you have studied micro rnas you have seen the role of cancer stem cells and so much more so do you feel have we reached the end stage are we close to the corner where we can say that we have achieved good enough for treating cancer we actually know squamous cell carcinoma well uh, or is more needed so what i feel about this is well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma there is nothing well about well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma so we do need to rethink we need to know more about squamous cell carcinoma so are you guys ready for some new thinking so let's go and see and put our thoughts on some new face it on new directions from which we can view squamous cell carcinoma next let's see an interesting fact the cells in our body are approximately 30 trillion and the number of microbes that live with us and help us to live a quality life is said 100 trillion so these are the number of cells which stay with us most of the time which is actually called as a normal microbiome so similarly in the oral cavity you have a large segment of microbiomes so now it is very clear that something has to go wrong with the oral microbiota or the microflora and this this regulation and this function of the oral microflora is called by dysbiosis so dysbiosis can actually set up a scene where it can promote carcinogenesis what is worse the microbe germ cells can actually secrete carcinogens which actually you know can be in the form of nitrosamines aldehydes or alcohol metabolites which can damage dna so they themselves can secrete carcinogens they do not need to depend on xyz but if xyz is promote carcinogenesis also next so as you can see the oral microorganisms themselves if they get into a state of imbalance they can support reactive oxygen species reactive nitrogen species they can form a lot of volatile sulfur compounds and organic acids next and intracellularly also what we know less about the microorganisms actually can finger into cell cycle regulation 
they can alter the invasive ability of the cells they can alter the apoptotic pathways and the interleukin secretions by the cells so all of this which can support cancer next so here is a set of microorganisms which we have already implicated so some of the major bacteria are provetella species intermedia tamera and some of the uncommon one as melanogenica and the other species are fusobacterium porphyromonas actinomyces clostridium candidea valionella so if you add both of these groups also how many do you think we have implicated maybe some dozen of microorganisms so are you in agreement that with some you know 100 trillion cells are in the oral cavity let us come down to one fourth of it so suppose let's say 25 trillion cells do we want to blame a dozen of microorganisms to cause dysbiosis and precipitate squamous cell carcinoma is it fair is that the truth that might be happening let's go ahead so in this you will realize that there are another 600 or maybe 800 species of microbiota or microbio you know organisms which have not been implicated so what do you say that they might be actively or passively taking part in carcinogenesis let's look at the symbol this is a symbol of yin and yang of taoism it says that everyone has two faces a good face and a bad face so if you tilt towards the good face there is good activity but there are phases in the environment which can tip you to a bad state so there are a lot of organisms which can actually you know tilt towards the other side and work towards carcinogenesis so a lot of microorganisms is this seen today can actually relate to toll like receptors you know which are present on our oral epithelial cells more frequently what we see are tlr2s and tlr4s right now they can engage them and keep them in a constant state of inflammation like a you know indolent or chronic inflammatory state and all of us know holding a tissue in a chronic state of inflammation itself good enough to trigger carcinogenesis with some amount of dysplastic cells so more and more number of cells might get implicated in carcinogenesis than what number we actually believe today next so it is open for your thought is it really some 12 organisms or these number of organisms that are you know causing cancer what type are they i would actually tell that you might have more than 100 species of bacteria which actually you know one for example a very simple thinking some set of microbes might be sec secreting metabolites that are you know pro cancer cells some microorganisms might be tilting the ph some microorganisms can be setting a reactive you know oxygen species some microorganisms can you know promote inflammation all of these microorganisms are unnamed but they can all tilt or set up an environment which favors carcinogenesis so do they remain like that that is doubtful so there is some good thought in this or there is a good side to this if the environment changes all these microorganisms i am sure will tilt towards health or towards homeostasis so this is a open thought for you and i welcome all of you to think on these points next so now let us go and look at our perception of cancer so are we ready to look at cancer cells as just a lump of you know cells which have gone crazy gone mad dysplastic cells without looking at the background no now we need to look at the background in which the cancer cells sit are these background tissue adding you know flavor adding might adding strength to the cancer cells very much yes and it is not just a non cellular extra cellular matrix but there are loads of cellular components in the extra cellular matrix like the platelets mast cells fibroblast you know lot of immune cells defense cells endothelial cells all of which are actually playing their role to promote cancer 
so do these cells belong to the you know the host to help in reinstating homeostasis or are they on the side of the cancer cells next now here we will understand that actually this is a very complex environment where a something or a lot of things have gone wrong because of which the environment has tilted the normal cells or so called normal cells into cells which are actually on the side of cancer cells so these cells actually start working for the cancer cells or the cancer associated signals next so in the tumor micro environment first i would like to take you through a couple of cells then we will look at the non cellular components also so in these my favorites are starting from cancer associated fibroblast uh, sorry fibroblasts macrophages neutrophils my favorite as a first line of defense the first foot soldiers regulatory t cells myeloid derived cells killer cells platelets and mast cells so we should come out of this story of internal talk of dysplastic cells now we know there is a external talk which happens with the cancer cells and cells in the extracellular matrix much before the cancer cell comes into the connective tissue even before a stage of anoikis jumping non cohesive dysplastic cells have already received support from fibroblast endothelial cells in the connective tissue which have already tilted their side towards the cancer cells and there is lot of common talk also that happens between the fibroblast and endothelial cells immune cells and killer cells you know and fibroblast and the immune cells so there is lot of cross talk which happens in the tumor microenvironment next now first let us have a look at the cancer associated fibroblasts these are the some of the simplest of the cells in the connective tissue most of the time in most of the pathology we don't even pay attention to the fibroblast and the collagen fibers sitting in the extracellular matrix right so what are these cells actually but let us understand first this is this can be called by many names they are either reactive fibroblasts they might be called as myofibroblasts they might be called as altered cancer fibroblasts embryonic fibroblasts or cancer associated fibroblasts please understand that these are a spectrum of cells this is not one single cell all of this might be different might be similar to myofibroblasts might be similar to you know embryonic fibroblasts with few extra features of stemness and aberrant behavior so they are actually complex organ fascicles these are neoplastic cells which are getting completely reprogrammed so these cancer associated fibroblasts are actually a cluster of different cells which look similar morphologically and function also quite similarly next so if you want to actually identify these cells you will actually see that you know first much before identification let us see you know what do these cells do and how do they help in carcinogenesis so you'll be surprised that these are the cells which are the main cells which favor the tumor microenvironment which actually gets tipped towards carcinogenesis so these are tumor promoting functions which are very important is actually altering the genetics improving cell proliferation of the cancer cells promoting angiogenesis recruitment of defense cells increasing the invasive capacity of the tumor cells maintain inflammation in the connective tissue which is pro tumor formation increase the metastatic potential and the worst of all is cause drug resistance so that also can be precipitated by a cancer fibroblast this happens because of secretions of chemokines and cytokines by the cancer associated fibroblast in the autocrine and a paracrine function next so the inc markers that you can actually use for identification like i told this is not a single cell so there is no single marker but most of the time these cells come positive for alpha sma 
FAD, FSPs are frequently taken up by these cells and why maintain, but no single marker will actually help you to target these cells. Now, these cells mainly secrete EGF, HEF, which are actually not secreted by normal fibroblasts. So, most of the secretions not only, you know, create a tumor microenvironment, which is tipped towards the cancer cell, what happens is these fibroblasts are also one of the important features is these fibroblasts also because of secretion of certain chemokines you know and cytokines remain in a constantly activated state so a normal cell can get into you know a swing between active and passive or dormant state but a cancer associated fibroblast constantly is in an activated state next so what is the story? Who forms this cancer-associated fibroblast? So like I told, one of the simplest cell that looks to be in the extracellular matrix, you will come to know that there is more than one mother for the cancer-associated fibroblast. It can actually arise from single fibroblast, from a resting fibroblast, which gets converted and activated. It can be, you know, uh, it can undergo MMT from pericytes. It can undergo NMT from endothelial cells. It can be formed by EMT by epithelial cells. It can be formed by adipocytes, marrow-derived cells, all of which can be converted into cancer-associated fibroblasts. So this has multiple mothers, all of which can form cancer-associated fibroblasts. So like I told, morphologically, all of them might be looking like, you know, spindle cells with invaropodias on their surface, but they can arise from numerous sources. Next. So what do these cells do? Like I told, maintaining a tumor environment that is pro-tumorous or cancer formation promotes invasion and actually the important functions that they might form in oral squamous cell carcinoma is recruitment of macrophages, not only that, and they ensure that M2 macrophages, that is the tumor-associated macrophages, get recruited in the tissue and stay there in an active phase. Then you get, you know, activation of endothelial cells for angiogenesis. They block the immune cells, almost make the, you know, tumors like cold tumors. They renew and, you know, allow the, you know, deposit of cancer stem cells to be active phase and part of carcinogenesis. And worst of all is to promote metabolic effects or metabolic changes in the tissue. Some of the details we will see further ahead. Next. So other than cancer-associated fibroblasts, the next significant thing is the simple you know foot soldier which comes you know to maintain innate and acquired immunity in the form of macrophages so you know these macrophages come into the area at high numbers and unfortunately we can get you know triggering of these macrophages the m1 macrophages are pro you know homeostasis and health whereas as m2 macrophages so called m2 macrophages are actually pro-cancer. So in this environment, cells like cancer-associated fibroblasts tip the, you know, activation of M2 macrophages. So what is the difference between these macrophages? Let's go ahead and have a look. Next. So as you can see here, M1 is pro-inflammatory and M, sorry, the other one is anti-inflammatory. So most of the cytokines and TGF beta will allow, you know, to see if a M1 or M2 gets precipitated. So invariably you will see in these instances, M2 macrophages is start, it will start getting honed into the tissue, which will promote inflammation in the tissue, which will promote carcinogenesis. Next, please. The next important cells other than the macrophage are neutrophils. So as I told, the first foot soldiers which come into a site of inflammation are actually neutrophils along with macrophages to take care of it. So here you will see that neutrophils actually end up with formation of lytic enzymes and reactive oxygen species. These are the first soldiers which actually die 
killing the noxious substance, whether it's a microorganism or a tumor cell or any other thing that has actually invaded a particular tissue. So is this all that the neutrophil does? Next, please. So one thing is clear, the neutrophil dies very quickly. So what is the death of the neutrophil actually called? So you can end up with necrosis, which is a very common form of neutrophilic death when you have infections. You can also have, you know, uh, necrosis die by other modes. For example, it can die because of apoptosis in some of the other, uh, you know, forms of pathosis. Then you have necroptosis also that can happen to the neutrophils. Then you have pyroptosis also, which is a new form of necrosis for neutrophils. And most interesting of them is called NETS. It's also called as, you know, suicidal necrosis or suicidal netosis. What does this actually mean? This actually means that the neutrophil actually throws up decondensed chromatin outside extracellularly and most of the neutrophilic cytosolic cytotoxic protein granules go and sit on this mesh. So they actually create a meshwork which is meant to be a trap. So these are called as nets. These are called as neutrophilic extracellular traps. So these are meant for the microbes to die but unfortunately these are used up as you know niches to maintain you know inflammation and these proteins are made use to for work to promote carcinogenesis so netosis unfortunately becomes a cell death process which is actually used up or advantageously used by the cancer cells there is one more form of you know death in neutrophils which is called by the name of vital necrosis that also is a phenomenon that is actually used up by the cancer cells. Other than these cell deaths which become contributory to carcinogenesis, the neutrophils also activate the platelets which take part in thrombosis leading to cancer-associated venous thromboembolisms. So for markers to identify these neutrophils which we thought might be good for the host but they are actually working for the cancer cell, Again, no single marker, but most of the time you can use CD11B, CD14, 15, and 16. These are some of the markers which might help you to understand that these are markers for neutrophil which are cancer associated. Now in cancer neutrophils also, next, you will see like microphages, there are N1 and N2 neutrophils. Next, please. So you will see that, you know, N1 are actually anti-tumor. They do not allow the progression of tumor. They allow apoptosis. There is, you know, blockade of TGF beta, increased presence of INF, which, you know, gets activated and invariably the activity it is in the form of anti-tumor. But if the cell, you know, shifts its phenotype because of what all chemokines are being secreted in the environment, the cell doesn't have a choice it gets transformed into a N2, that is a pro-tumor type or the N2 type of neutrophil, which actually secretes MMPs or v v vascular endothelial growth factors and CHC ligand proteins, which actually promote carcinogenesis. So N2 neutrophils are something we have to look forward to and the various forms of neutrophilic death that actually promote carcinogenesis. Next. So what are these cells? So the next sets of cells are the myeloid derived suppressor cells. So these are a, again, a large family of, you know, heterogeneous population of cells, which actually all of them unfortunately work towards inhibition of immune cells. So if this family steps in to, you know, on the side of cancer cells, then our cell, you know, our story seems to be almost done. Why so? Because if these cells start working, they end up with, you know, T cell activation and death of, you know, T cells which are working towards homeostasis. T ranks get increased, which promote carcinogenesis. Natural killer cells which are promoting health will be kicked out of the tissue. So in other words, what do they do? 
they will completely alter the tumor microenvironment. Tumor microenvironment at the cancer site, yes, what can happen worse? These set of cells at the time when the primary tumor is growing can also grow to a different site and create metastatic niche. So these set of cells or these family of cells are lethal to us because at the time when they're promoting carcinogenesis, growth of cancer cells and formation or promotion of cancer are actually already set a metastatic niche at single or multiple sites in lymph nodes or elsewhere in the body. Next. So here you will see, so who caused these cells? Why would someone call these kind of cells? So like I told, in the tumor microenvironment with excessive secretions of interleukin-6 or, you know, with the deposition of colony factors of particular kind or vascular endothelial growth factors, invariably the microenvironment will invariably tilt towards inviting these cells the moment these cells step into the tumor microenvironment, they work like, you know, soldiers who go on depleting arginine, tryptophan, cysteine, and increase the reactive oxygen, you know, nitrogen species, reactive sulfur species, arginase, and tip the whole scenario towards promoting cancer. Next. So if you see... Like I told, there are certain cell markers for these, you know, cells also. So these were actually called as immature CD34 cells previously. But now you will see that they can come positive for CD11, 33, 14, 15. These are some of the common markers used for identification of these cells. Next. So the next is the regulatory T cells. So regulatory T cells are the biggest boon for self tolerance. So these are the cells which keep us good, you know, and keep us safe out of autoimmune diseases. But here what happens is these are the cells that are the first cells to get, you know, clinged on to the cancer cells. And unfortunately, they hold the reins for modulation of T cells that are CD4 cells and CD8 cells, the, you know, calling and the maturation of B cells, invitation for NK cells, the natural killer cells, macrophages. So all of this gets tilted towards carcinogenesis, which is actually tipped by the cancer cells. So some of the common markers that we can use for cancer associated with, you know, T-Rex cells are CD4, CD25. Unfortunately, like I told, there are no great markers for these cells because they can also be expressed by some of the, you know, uh, T cells, which are effector cells also. But some of them like FOXP3, CTLA can actually help you more in maybe telling that probably these cells, if they're coming positive for most of these markers, might be T-Rex cells, which are cancer associated. Next, please. So how do you understand these cells better? So actually, these cells can be divided into two classes in health also, based on phenotype, location, and the origin. So these are the called as the thymus derived, which actually display the FOXP3 expression on them. They are called as the natural cells. But the other cells which you see on the periphery are actually induced or adaptive cells. So all of them come CD4 and CD25 positive. So if you have a lot of CD4, you know, and uh, T cells which are positive on the peripheral front, most of them actually get tipped towards carcinogenesis. Next, please. So T-Rex, whether they are contact dependent or independent, once they are working along with cancer cells, they use up multiple systems like inhibitory cytokine suppression or suppression of cytolysis, T effector cell suppression, meaning don't allow homeostasis to be reinstated, you know, then suppression of maturation and function of, for example, B cells or memory cells. All of this are different methods by which T-Rex actually 
keeps the immune system in suppression. Next, please. So the next we come to platelets. So platelets are something which we commonly believe all the time help in wound healing by formation of a thrombus. So most of the time that's all we understand about platelets. So, but what we should need to understand about platelets is they are one of the key players in early stages of tumor microenvironment setting and also in late stage of migration of cancer cells. So in tumor microenvironment, by the secretion of certain type of, you know, dense granules or alpha granules or lysozymes, which are present in this, in this mm -hmm. anucleotic, you know, anucleotic cells actually help the setting up of tumor microenvironment. So once these granules are released, it invariably allows you know, clustering or, you know, aggregation of platelets. This aggregation leads to vasoconstriction, which later cascades into cell proliferation and regulation and uh, environment of hypoxia. Next. So if you see the detail of, you know, what are these dense granules or lysosomes and alpha granules, you will see this is not a single granule, but these are enzyme systems or acids of vast types which are actually released by the platelets, some of which I have named them for you, which actually most of them are important for altering the extracellular matrix in cancer. Next. So invariably, like I told, the platelets will ensure inflammation in the tumor microenvironment, angiogenesis and growth of tumor cells. Now the platelet also act as a you know a very special host for cancer cells please remember this word of a you know a special host to the cancer cells we will get back to that in a few minutes next so what do the mast cells have to do in cancer especially oral cancer so mast cells all of the time we associate them with allergies and release of histamines but here you will see the any of enzymes which the histamines can, you know, or, or a non-histamine components which can be released by mast cells. It is surprising that a lot of these secretions actually can be pro-carcinogenesis or can promote cancer growth. So invariably we see in homeostasis or in health as a part of, you know, immune reactions to allergy, you see exocytosis. So it's very frequent to see mast cells loaded with granules when you do a special stain and just all of them coming extracellularly in the form of exostosis. That is how mast cells work. But now what has been discovered is there is a new mechanism the mast cells also use which actually makes them change their phase. Like I told from yin to yang where they use something which is called as, you know, piecemeal degradation. So they don't go into exostosis, but keep throwing single granules of, you know, the enzymes that they prepare in the form of piecemeal. So this piecemeal constantly keeps feeding the tissue with inflammatory components and raises up the indolent inflammation in the tissue. So don't be surprised. If you see mast cells in squamous cell carcinoma or in some of the rampant malignancies like malignant melanoma also. Next. So the mast cells, like I told, can be through tumor. So most of them, they can be tilted towards, pre, you know, anti-tumor, That, but that depends on what story is being sung in the extracellular matrix. If there are huge number of cytokines and chemokines that favor the tilting of, you know, the mast cells, then they just go on to a phase which is pro-tumor and help in the formation of angiogenesis or neovascularization, then extracellular matrix degradation, induction of T cell proliferation, which are already working for the cancer cell. Next. Now, next is let us have a look at natural killer cells. So these are one of the most loyalist. I like these cells because most of the time it is not easy to take over natural killer cells. So and so in oral cancer 
or squamous cell carcinoma. So the natural killer cells actually are the first cells which quickly detect either microorganisms and tumor cells, most of which are the are in, you know, CD16 or 56 positive. 90% of the time they are expressed as dim 60, you know, 56 and bright 16. That is how you see the presentation of you know staining in these cells. Now, all these cells are pro-host, meaning good for homeostasis and kill the cancer cell. But the tumor microenvironment doesn't allow the propagation, doesn't allow the entry or the activity of the natural killer cells. Are there some new variants of killer cells? Yes, there are. Next, please. There are something which are called as NKT cells. So this is like I told how it is wholly dependent on, you know, what secretions, you know, or what receptors get activated or shut down based on which the killer cells can get into an active scenario and work or get blocked out and are kept away from a tumor microenvironment. Next. So here you will see that there is something called NKT cells. So these are actually a lineage of cells which are very similar to killer cells and also to uh, you know, lymphoid lineage, very similar to the T cells. So these are a subpopulation which act as a passage or, you know, in a method which is in between innate and adaptive immunity. So these are generally pro-host, most of the time work to the advantage of the host tissue. So similarly, there is also one small subset of population which is called as invariant natural killer cells or invariant INKT cells. These are also pro-host or homeostasis and work against the cancer cells. All of these cells which get blocked and do not get expressed in the tumor microenvironment, which is tilted towards carcinogenesis. Next. So here we have seen loads of cells from cancer-associated fibroblast, mast cells, neutrophils, even in death, how they are used to advantage by the, you know, cancer cells. Now we have a look at the extracellular matrix, the component that are non-cellular. Most of them are either biochemical supports or just physical to which we might not be paying a lot of attention. But here you will see that these are generally in the form of, you know, glycoproteins, growth factors or proteoglycans or fibers like collagen, you know, elastin, tenesin, most of the fibrilla component. So in cancer, the extracellular matrix deregulation and disorganization in one of, is one of the key for promotion of cancer, how it comes down to active invasion and invasion into the connective tissue. So this helps in not only local invasion, but also in distant metastasis also in promotion of angiogenesis. So how does this happen? Next, if you see collagen, which we thought was actually, you know, uh, some fibrils which might be actually protective in nature. Next, please. Are actually not fibrils which are very, you know, silent. They are actually fibrils which help the cancer cells to migrate. They help other cancer-associated cells to migrate, to proliferate and all. And what we used to think all these days, there is a huge role reversal also. Most of the MMPs which we believe are promoting cancer, we thought is actually secreted by the extracellular matrix or by the primary tumor cell. Now we know three times the amount of these secretions are actually coming from stromal cells. Yes, don't be surprised. Most of it comes from cancer-associated fibroblasts and other inflammatory cells which are tipped towards cancer. So what you will see is the expression of collagen, elastin, fibronectin, laminin, and tenacin. All of this help in proliferation of tumor, cell migration of cancer-associated cells, and cell headies. All of this are towards the progression of cancer. Especially if you end up with loads of fibronectin, then you can almost say it's like a poor marker for prognosis in the extracellular matrix. Next, please. Dr. Radhika. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, can I interrupt you? 
um is how many slides are left just a few more maybe seven eight yeah, but, uh okay uh because i think dr ragu has another meeting to go to okay um, so we'll compile very quickly hmm? okay yeah okay right so as we see here so tumor syphilis is another induration which we call as a hallmark of cancer when you check a patient clinically this is because of 30% collagen and fibronectin which is actually promoting tumor formation invasion and decreased treatment response next so in other words i have actually taken you through the cells and the extracellular matrix components which actually form the main tumor microenvironment so here you will actually see that all of this contribute towards carcinogenesis in a very active way not only to promote cancer but keep them guard of guarded from treatment modalities raising questions of resistance to treatment also next can you just go ahead by few cells yes so here is another concept which i wanted to browse that is behavioral cell science so go ahead so this just goes to tell you you can go two cells uh, you know two slides ahead so this just tells you about a rare and you know a very important phenomena that is triggered by cancer cells which is called as warburg effect you know so this effect actually clips the metabolism for from oxidation to anaerobic glycolysis which is taken up by the tumor cells and the metabolites that are produced by this warburg effort actually are pro tumor they can keep flourishing themselves with whatever basic you know constituents they need for growth and hence they do not really you know depend on the host cell for their metabolism or for energy next please so this is what i was talking about this is aerobic glycolysis which is set up by the cancer cells next please so this kind of metabolism sustains cancer cells in good or bad times so sometimes even if you have oxygen the cancer cells refuse to go back to oxidation methods but continue in aerobic glycolysis mode itself next please so in primary tumor cancer associated fibroblasts can actually tip all of these cells into a cold state and make a tumor cold by blocking all these cells so that is the important of extracellular matrix so if you kill or you know silence the cancer associated fibroblast you will see that the cd4 cdx cells start coming into the primary tumor you can suddenly make a cold tumor hot and they respond much better to tumor so run through the next two few slides where i have just summed up the effect of most of these cells in a primary tumor you can go ahead ragu yeah so these are what happens like i told with neutrophils with tams please go ahead yeah with mast cells and killer cells and myeloid derived stem cells yes please go ahead please go ahead so this is the role of you know the fibrilla component yes uh, yeah so come to the slide next one please yeah so here i just want to take you with on a small journey we want to believe that the cancer cells are rogue cells and they end up with you know formation of cancer and spread of all of it so do you want to believe that the connective tissue cells which didn't allow anoikis allowed the emt so the cells came into the connective tissue and worse enough the cancer cell talks to the endothelial cell so the endothelial cells allow the tumor emboli to get into the vascular stream these areas are areas where they could have got killed but our great host like i told you the platelet the unique host puts a cloak on the tumor cells which is called as a platelet cloak not only does it cloak the tumor cells and hide them from recognition it transfers some of its ligand also to the tumor cells which allows them to break back or extravasate from the vascular component and go to a metastatic niche thanks to the myeloid derived cells the home is already set for them there where they undergo met and form secondary tumor masses so all these story happens because of the support from the extracellular matrix 
and the components of the extracellular matrix. Next, please. So in the PMD, the story is very different from in cancer. You see a good expression of CD8 killer cells and TAMs, which are pro-homeostasis. But any PMD, forget looking at only the dysplastic cells from these days. If you find a lot of cancer-associated fibroblasts, it means it's bad prognosis. It might tip the whole thing towards invasive phenotype. The same story with the presence of tenacin. So looking at you know extracellular matrix in PMDs might be a meaningful story these days. Next, please. So in conclusion, this is a long journey from a lump of cells to a journey where cells sit in an extracellular matrix with cellular component, non-cellular components. The great story of yin and yang of a host of cells like neutrophils, mast cells, macrophages, and so many other myeloid derived cells which can tip towards health or tip, tip towards cancer or disease. Next, please. So all of us should give thought that is killing of cancer the only solution which we have been looking at for a long time? Not really. The primary killing or removal surgically of the cancerous growth might be a good idea. But if you do not want it to regrow, if you do not want, you know, recurrences, if you want, you know, response to therapy, reprogramming of the extracellular matrix is something that all of us have to give thought to if we are thinking of finding solutions for treatment of cancer or control of cancer also in a long time to come. Thank you so much. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was a very extensive and uh, thorough one. So uh, I think I will uh, talk to Sandhya now. This time we have a little different, so I can actually bring the questions on the screen and you all can take it. So here is one question. Can you see that? Yes, 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 yes. So uh, is okay. there any correlation between psychological factors, stress, hormones, and cultural analysis? Yes, absolutely, I think so. There are a lot of, you know, uh, chemicals which we didn't pay attention to. So if you get the secretion of those chemokines and cytokines, so all these days, like layman, which we would tell that these are good feel hormones and bad feel hormones, actually they make sense because they set up a tumor microenvironment which is in the favor of disease which doesn't allow good healing also forget cancer those kind of tissue microenvironments are not great areas for normal healing to occur so they do actually promote carcinogenesis the second bad thing they might be doing is some chemokines and cytokines secreted in particular concentrations tip the normal cell which would have acted in favor of you like a good neutrophil but the neutrophil can get tipped towards n2 type and start acting towards the cancer cell so that is true psychological stress tissue stress all of that can actually precipitate carcinogenesis not independently but by alteration of the extracellular matrix or the tumor microenvironment Dr. Sandhya, you can put in your uh, additions at any point if you want. Uh, Dr. Raghu yes. had to leave. Yeah. Yes. So just feel free to chirp in whenever you feel like. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So here is our next question. Yeah. Uh, Warburg effect, is it still considered as a metabolic pathway of cancer? I think, uh, like I told, uh, this is about behavioral science, you know? So when we get beaten, what do we end up with? We end up with a state where we sit and cry and we tell, we didn't get this, I am not getting this, I am not feeling good. This happens to the cancer cells in a first shot. They get banned so much because of their own growth, they go and sit in an environment that is loaded with hypoxia. 
So what do they do then? Okay, hypoxia induced factor promotes cancer, but who is going to feed these cells? So their cancer cell doesn't sit for us or the host to, you know, produce something that is pro-cancer. It just says, okay, so you stop serving pizzas to me. So I will order continental. So it just steps out from a conventional metabolic system of oxidation and goes to anaerobic glycolysis. Not only does it end up with, you know, some kind of lactases which are generated by this system, they generate more ATP with less energy usage. And this system also, you know, is a rogue system. Why? Because it creates certain components which are set to the cancer-associated fibroblast. It is, you know, fed to the macrophage. So it doesn't make food only for the cancer cell. It makes food for the tumor-associated cells telling, oh, I ordered something for you also. Please eat this and be on my side. So Warburg effect is a huge effect that is pro-cancer. And I think it acts very, it might be dynamic, but it does act very strongly in cancerous areas. Here's the next one from Dr. Priya. Yeah. How many, <clears throat> how tumor stroma and tumor microenvironment are different compositionally? Okay. So tumor stroma, uh, it's as simple as, you know, a stroma is something uh, as a pathologist that you can see. So it's the background tissue, whether it be proteins, it is the fibrillar component like collagens or fibronectins. It is the cells like your mast cells or uh, macrophages or uh, natural killer cells or B cells, whatever you get to see. So that is what is called as the stroma. Okay, But the microenvironment actually speaks of volumes of the components that is there in the environment that includes various type of MMPs, interleukins, growth factors, you know, and smaller secretions which actually promote the tilting of cells to a pro-carcinogenic state. So all these secretions and, you know, small proteins, small enzymes also, which you cannot see histologically, but you can use markers to see them. You can use certain, you know, advanced studies to pinpoint the amount of this protein in a microenvironment. So all that set the stage for a microenvironment. So loads of ingredients, good food, nice energy metabolic, uh, you know, metabolizing things, along with the stroma is the microenvironment. And the next one also is from Priya. Okay. Is endothelial mesenchymal transition evident in oral cancers? Actually, uh, to tell you the truth, a lot of us have done EMT markers also in cancer. But you will get to see that most of the time among the code of markers, like, you know, snail, twist, so many markers are there for EMT also. But you will get marking or presence of only few of these markers. There are two reasons, like I told. Because the pathway taken up by EMT expression might not be very simple or single. Non-canonical pathways might be taken up. But it might also be true that you, you might be looking for, you know, something in the tissue which happens in a very dynamic way. So degranulation just happens like this. Then you see the granules in the tissue. Similarly, EMT might happen very quickly. So using markers for EMT might not be a great way. So similarly, but I believe endothelial mesenchymal transition, not only does it happen in OSCC, it happens in oral submucous fibrosis also, but you don't get to see it all the time. Right. So the next one is from Dr. Varis. Yes. Can cancer-associated fibroblasts rise from myofibroblasts? Okay. Like I told, uh, to tell you the truth, first is it is very clear. All of us have to accept, in, like in salivary gland tumors, we always read of SNR cells and this ductal cell and all, and two lines about a basket cell. But then we know who is the Cinderella of all salivary gland pathology and tumors. It's the myoepithelial cell. Similarly, in oral cancer, the queen, the unnamed queen of all the extracellular or the tumor microenvironment is the cancer-associated fibroblast. Like I told, they, they might be myofibroblast themselves, but they are not pro-healing. 
they are you know triggered into a state or they are frozen into a state where they maintain inflammation but do not allow completion of healing they can be in the form of modified fibroblasts they can be in the form of myofibroblasts embryonic or stemness having fibroblasts and myofibroblasts so there are lots of questions the next one is from dr akshay yeah so can microbiome contribute in formation of pre metastatic niche i think to a good extent like i told the main cells are the myeloid derived cells which actually set up the you know metastatic niche for oli cancer cells but i also believe uh, microbiomes also might be the invisible background uh, you know uh, cells like like i tell in the oli cavity itself so quickly one bout of fever just changes the taste in our mouth so what happens in one day there is a massive tilt of the type of microorganisms that died and that were promoted and you know upgraded so such things happen in the tissue micro environment they might be cells or microbes which might be promoting metabolites which are useful to the cancer cells they might be useful to the you know warburg effect they might be useful for tipping the fibroblast to become cancer associated fibroblast that is a good possibility we very little work has been done on them actually this next one is from dr nasa said yeah okay the role of mmps and you know enzymes in intrim tissue with a role in inflammation like i told some of these are pro inflammation meaning actually they are part of healing but if they are you know sustained for a longer time then they become a indolent inflammatory scene and like i told but they are incomplete in some way so these mmps and enzymes actually promote a environment which allows breakdown of the extracellular matrix so it's like slapping inflammation and keep on telling you hey this is useful for you this is useful for you after the fifth slap it hurts the tissue breaks down and opens up for invasion okay sorry so this so invasion is local or distant metastasis and here yeah, next one from dr varis again actually he has two questions Yes. Uh, so you so, can take this first, and then we'll okay. take the next one. So, uh, the interesting thing is why I picked up this topic is what are the therapeutic, you know, targeting these cells in the tumor micro? Like I told, uh, platelet clocks. And I found it very interesting that you know our own host cells are actually covering the tumor cells and telling you, please, you know, take this transit system and go to different places. i will even you know give you some ligands so that you can exit from the endothelial cells and go into the metastatic deposit how is that even possible that that is what happens there is no work that has happened on this sphere in oral squamous cell carcinoma the only work that has happened in tumor microenvironment is as all of us might know is associated with cancer associated fibroblast so now we are coming to know that this is not a single cell so it is not easy to tackle it but lot of them are trying to at least silence the cancer associated fibroblasts so if you attended some talks in the you know international iop conference dr hunter told us so first make the cancer associated fibroblasts to just shut them out they will allow the cd4 and cdx cells to come and this allows for a cold tumor to become hot then automatically they will start responding to our treatment in the same way if you close down or reprogram cancer associated fibroblasts they might allow the ingress of natural killer cells also most of the work is happening with cancer associated fibroblasts not reprogramming but shutting them at least for the time being okay i think the two next questions are sort of repeated this is from dr varis major challenges in researching and there is the next one is from dr arvind babu it is about again any breakthroughs in the treatment aspects so one is about yeah. in the, the research and one is in treatment yeah 
breakthrough in uh, research for example first i will answer it about therapeutics so there are some therapeutics agents which are already being tried like i told to block cancer associated fibroblast and next is uh, the next uh, guys who get promoted for this are the macrophages that is the m2 macrophages okay so uh, but very uh, limited success has been reached because like i told you the most of these defense cells are like you and me they have a yin and yang they have one phase and the other so you don't know which side it will get tipped because of the constituents in the tumor micro environment so a lot of research work is happening on what actually tips this cell so what can we do without even touching or killing them reprogram them to a pro health phase so for example in neutrophil get the n1 phase more activated in macrophages get the m1 phase more activated in the mast cell please tell don't feed piecemeal to the tissue and keep them in a constant state of inflammation please do exocytosis take care of the you know allergy or take care of the response allow it to heal so most of the research is happening on that reprogramming okay what currently available as ihc epithelial and stromal markers would you advocate to use to gauge imminent invasion of potentially malignant ha huh. so in this actually more than epithelial markers i would advocate the use of actually uh, mesenchymal markers so those markers which i suggested for you know uh, targeting uh, tenacin or uh, proteins which target tenacin or uh, proteins which mark uh, cancer associated fibroblast are a sure shot message that the dysplasia is going to step towards invasive type more than epithelial markers i would actually go towards you know uh, mesenchymal markers stromal markers fap's okay angiogenesis takes place in several ways trans differentiation yeah okay right what type of oscc uh, okay uh, so angiogenesis and neoangiogenesis can happen because of various pathways there are no single pathways all that we know very clearly which we keep harping on is you know hypoxia inducible factor and it promotes angiogenesis most of the time we uh, fail to recognize if it is neoangiogenesis which is complete or incomplete so i think a lot of it might be happening by commoner pathways but not all of them are canonical pathways okay so i think we can stop now and uh, the only thing is what i feel is that i am going to show a few of the other comments because with everything that happened i'm going to have to probably trim this and redo the stream which means we will lose the live chat so i will just show some of the comments that uh, so that they will remain with us in the long term one is of course thanks to dr radhika from dr bindu then uh, these are all the uh, everyone who said very nice presentation and so, um, i want to take a minute here if you allow me yes please today scenario has actually taught us what tumor micro environment is all about with loads of research and technology how we are unable to counteract cancer at the right stage and improve the morbidity and mortality with loads of technology and macbook in my hand this is where we ended i am extremely sorry but this is what can happen so this is the yin and yang and this is the dynamism of real life stories Uh, yes, and I think you know where we, we began with stories. So uh, this is another story. Now we will. Everyone who was here today, right, from the fact that the stream started, actually, everyone was waiting on another link, and then we had to go and I had to go and put a thing. In. Oh no, you don't have to be sorry. These things happen, and this is again something we learn from, and we move on. <laughs> It's one more thing I will remember to check. So <laughs> I guess. 
it's a learning process and it's an experience we had together and so did so many others yes not at all by the way dr sandhya you wanted to add anything to the um, uh, to the whole uh, summing yes. up what you find interesting in the tumor yes. microenvironment yes 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 i have been reading this uh, tumor microenvironment especially cancer associated fibroblast since few years and today no i remembered that poem on a cancer uh, composed by professor sobin and beautifully he was trying to uh, solve the jigsaw puzzle of cancer and one statement he mentioned that purely uh, um, uh, could be a tumor stroma which holds all the clue perhaps it's the tumor stroma which holds all the clue so i feel today's discussion is the perfect uh, example to justify or to find out the answer of that particular statement and uh, secondly this cancer associated fibroblast many people are thinking about what is the origin origin so when i was reading no uh, so they have mentioned like uh, various mesenchymal cells then endothelial cells and um, two more interesting origin uh, i have found one is um, neuroectoderm also and uh, neoplastic epithelial cells also can transform into uh, cancer associated fibroblasts through autocrine paracrine effects okay so like they have multiple origins so that is why it is very difficult to control those uh, cancer associated fibroblasts and secondly uh, the, there are many proteins as madam said uh, radhika madam like there are multiple proteins present inside those fibroblasts so if we want to evaluate can cancer associated fibroblasts we have to uh, detect those proteins so two more widely researched proteins sma and fibroblast activation protein alpha as madam said so this fibroblast activation protein two interesting articles i want to mention like we always talk about uh, epithelial malignancies but as far as our odontogenic lesions are concerned ameloblastoma though it is benign it behaves aggressively locally aggressive so i was searching like has anyone uh, found out uh, cancer associated fibroblast in relation with ameloblastoma so one interesting study by uh, researchers from thailand no they have uh, evaluated this fibroblast activation protein alpha in cancer associated fibroblast through cell culture studies and they found a uh, good association like the fap expression was high with uh, even benign tumor ameloblastoma so this is one and second study i want to mention from radiology field so what they did they uh, injected one um, fap uh, 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 i uh, radio tracer fibroblast activation protein uh, inhibitor in uh, in the body of um, many patient multiple tumors like in thyroid cancer uh, prostate cancer breast cancer it's so 12 types of cancer they have injected this radio tracer and within 10 minutes this fapi penetrated cancer associated fibroblast so all those tumor deposits in the body uh, got detected after that they took a pet scan and all those 12 different types of pet scan they made a collage and they got uh, image of the uh, 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 ear award by uh, society of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging in 2019 so best research award they got so the take home message is the target is, target these days is tumor stroma not the malignant epithelial cells and this radio tracer they claim that this radio tracer has a um, um, like a promising results as far as future therapeutic effects and investigations are concerned so thank you so much radhika ma'am i think we all have learned through your uh, presentation i think you have put together many conferences in today's session so all jigsaw puzzle all pieces of jigsaw puzzle you have put together and you have narrated this story of cancer in a beautiful uh, 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 like simplified uh, explanation of uh, cancer so thank you so much sandhya uh, thanks a lot actually that was interesting to hear that bit of uh, which i have also had a look at it's a very interesting field to put attention on actually yes 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 thank you so now i shall go back to sharing a screen so that i can uh, share your certificates
So, is it being shared? Oh no, I have to also share it from here. Yes, okay. So Dr. Radhika, thank you so much. Uh, you have been on the way to coming to the channel for some time. <laughs> and we finally made it. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Yes. And we, I'm sharing from this side. Okay. Okay. Of course, Raghu did all the sharing of the slides, but then he had to leave. So he apologized to everyone. Anyway, he had done his bit. So, yes. And next, uh, Dr. Sandhya, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and for the summing up also. And that was very interesting information you shared. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, yes, thank you all for being here. It And more than ever today, I think uh, the, this was a very challenging one, even for all of you to leave one stream and come to another link. So I'm very thankful that you still followed through and you still came here. Um, thanks so much. It's uh, Hopefully it won't happen again. Although it is technology, it will happen in some form, but let's just hope it will not happen in this form again. Uh, you know, there is this thing which says, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. This is one of those things. Murphy's laws, yes. Absolutely. And it does so more when it is technology involved. Yes. <laughs> so it is whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So it happened today. Okay. Now uh, coming to the forthcoming uh, events, uh, the first one. In fact, to, uh, and this is a link I will have to change because this was where we were watching the program. So this link will change. But please be aware that this is coming up. I know may not be of particular interest to oral pathologists uh, per se, but to our younger colleagues who may want to go to the US. Now, Dr. Lagreka, basically she is herself someone who has moved to the US from Latin America. And uh, she has got done her own licensing. And not only that, not only her personal experience, but she is running, she is the founder of the International Dentist, where every week she interviews one new person who has moved to the US and set up either in practice or in academics or in research or even in business. That is all dentists. So there's a lot of information that is there. So please share this with your younger colleagues, whoever may be interested. And also after that, yes. The next one, the next Tuesday, oh, it's going to be me speaking to you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm still, this has been something pending a long time uh, where, uh, I mean, this was the reason I started the channel was. That's thank, you. That's <laughs> thank you. This was the reason actually now it's taken a year. But so first step uh, we are having, this was basically to deal in a lot of ways, not just with oral pathology 360, which is our global face, but with the oral pathology India and the problems we have in the fraternity here. So I think one of those first things I would like to cover is to discuss the possibility of using a professional advocacy uh, to basically get oral pathology ahead in India. And I do hope you all will join me and uh, be a part of this. It would be very great if you can um, join us for this. And uh, I will definitely hope you can. Well, that is about all that there is to say for today. And let me say bye and uh, see everybody. Thank see you. you. Bye -bye. This time, not next Thank Tuesday. You. See you on Friday. Yeah. Have a good day. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you too. Bye. See you all. Bye. So we are.